A proposal to expand the Canada Pension Plan is gaining steam. Many workplace or company pensions are being cut or inadequately funded, so the thinking is a CPP expansion would hold obvious benefits for those looking to retire. But while receiving more CPP benefits at retirement may be nice, many are cautioning that the cost of CPP expansion might be too much to bear for the economy right now. So, joining us to discuss the two sides of the CPP coin, Tony Keller, who is the editorial board editor at the Globe and Mail, and William Robson, president and CEO of the C.D. Howe Institute. I've got my alphabet well right there. Well said. <laughs> Not easy to say, but well said. Tony, I want to start with you because you wrote an editorial in the Globe and Mail. It kind of got us thinking about this. You said the CPP, quote, is like the world's finest twin-size duvet trying to cover a king-size bed. Meaning yeah. what? So, the CPP is a well-run, well-funded, comprehensive, defined benefit pension plan. You know how much you're going to pay in as a worker. You know how much you're going to get out at retirement. Its only defect is it's modest. It's relatively small. It does not cover that much. And we could do quite a bit more to assure the uh, income security and retirement of particularly middle-income Canadians if we expanded this already very good, but small, pension plan. That's it. You said modest, meaning you couldn't live off it. You couldn't live off it. You would see your standard of living decline pretty substantially unless you were very low income when you were in your working years. Gotcha. It's Bill? only about $12,000 a year. It's the maximum you can get out of CPP. Understood. Bill, you're opposed. I'm no. kind of okay with the CPP the way it is. A uh, tiny bit of history. It used to be a total Ponzi game. Back in the 60s, it looked as though the economy was going to grow so quickly that we could just pay the contributions straight out as benefits. And then by the 80s and 90s, it became clear that wasn't going to work, that it was hugely intergenerationally unfair because young people were going to be asked to pay far, far higher contributions for the same package of benefits. Uh, so in the mid-late 1990s, we stabilized it. We ramped the contribution rates up. We got the CPP investment fund that's now earning some extra income. And the whole idea behind that is to stabilize it over many decades. You look around the world, hardly anybody has been able to pull off a reform like that. I think it's amazing that we did it because it was a rare example where there's a bit of a sacrifice up front for the sake of long-term stability. I would leave it alone. Um, there's Do you still, agree, though, that 12 grand a year is not enough to live off of? It was never intended to be. There's also the old age security. There's the guaranteed income supplement for people who are very much uh, at the bottom end. And then everybody was supposed to put some extra saving aside, either in a company pension plan. It was never intended to be the mainstay for retirement. And what I worry about now is that people are saying, uh, we're a little worried people aren't going to have enough. We're going to look to the nearest, handiest thing and... I haven't seen any of the proposals in detail yet. What PEI is proposing, nobody's actually showed the numbers, but I would bet any amount of money uh, that there's a bit of a payment up front and somebody further down the line is going to be asked to pick up a towel. Want to respond to that? Yeah, I'm not sure I, I agree with that. I mean, I, I agree partly with the history that you've laid out, because originally CPP was what was known as this pay-as-you-go system, which you could call a Ponzi scheme. It was essentially, I'll, I'll get, you, could. you know, yeah. I'll retire, and the people who are still working will pay for me. The idea of CPP now is that much more it is a case of you're paying in and you are helping to contribute to eventually funding your own retirement in the future. It's complicated, it's a hybrid because it used to be pay as you go. Nevertheless, it's a much better system. Any actuary who looks at it says, this thing is sound for 75 years out. And I hear what you're saying about the idea was once upon a time, CPP would cover part of your retirement mm -hmm. and your own private savings would cover part of your retirement. The thing was private savings, a lot of that was supposed to be company pension plans. And we know those are declining, those are being pulled back. Uh, the CPP is a very, very good option in an atmosphere like that because you know what, you, what you're going to get and you get to pool risk across uh, millions of people and across many, many years. There's a huge benefit to doing that. What and about the cheap. notion, Bill, that the, the so-called company pension plan ain't what it used to be and therefore we do need to bump this up in order to cover off that? I do worry that we're not saving enough. Yeah, absolutely. I, That's so not what I, think, I was referring to. I though. think we agree on that. Well, company pension plans are failing because they were defined benefit pension plans and they made promises based on investment returns that they were hoping to earn but hadn't yet earned. And then when they didn't earn them, all of a sudden, well, you see what's happening in Detroit. It's not just in the private sector, but in the public sector, this can happen too. One of the problems I had with what Tony just said is that the CPP isn't funded in the sense that, say, an RRSP is, where you've put money aside and at the end of the day, you're going to get out whatever the money can pay for. The CPP, even now, is counting on investment returns that haven't yet been earned. 
And in fact, with the latest longevity figures and with returns where they are, it's very likely that already we're going to have to do some adjustments. We're going to have to raise the contribution rate higher than 9.9%. There's provision to cut the benefits. And I would say um, we're going to have trouble navigating that without there being a bit of a grab from the future because the political imperative is always to get something now and then further down the road, uh, let somebody else pay for it. And I don't want to get off onto a topic that might be a little difficult to address properly here, but when I hear a lot of the union leaders that are pushing CPP expansion, one of the things I'm thinking is, how does that work for their plans? How does that help? If it's actuarially fair, if they're saving up front, that's going to mean smaller contributions into a lot of the, the, the public sector plans, because they're integrated with the CPP, the contributions are. The benefits that are going to relieve them of some of the need to pay benefits out in the future are going to happen way later. So the only way it can work for them, the only way it can relieve some of those plans of some of their big deficits is, in fact, if it is actuarially unfair and well, there's a big payment up front. Tony, let me put one of the other criticisms I hear to you, which is that, okay, not a bad idea, not good timing. The economy can't afford this right now. Yeah. What's your view on that? Well, the reform that's being proposed, I mean, Bill mentioned it, the PEI reform, which is based on uh, uh, Wolfson's work. He's at the University of Ottawa. He's a former deputy chief st statistician at StatsCan. Uh, it's a fairly modest increase in contributions. It would be phased in over several years. Right now, the contribution rate for CPP, and I know we're going to get lost in numbers here, 9.9% of your, of your salary up to about 50000 split 50-50 between the employer and the employee. Mm -hmm. It's going to rise from 99 to 13. It's a fairly small increase, 1.5% one, one to the employer, 1.5% to the individual, phased in over several years. We did the huge doubling of CPP premiums in the 90s. The economy wasn't sunk, so I think a fairly modest thing like this will not sink employers. And to add to something that Bill just said, if you increase the Canada Pension Plan, you increase contributions, a lot of existing pension plans right now would actually have their contributions, those private pension plans would see contributions decreased because they're, they're supposed to be integrated. So in, for many employers, it wouldn't necessarily cost them anything more. It might even save them money. He says the economic impact isn't that significant. Well, I think there's not enough saving happening. So I would not object to the CPP expansion on those grounds. Like suppose they went to a top up where any of us could, and maybe with a certain amount of arm twisting, uh, were obliged to put money that the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board would invest for us. And then when the time comes that we draw on that, there's actual cash there. I'd say that's okay. In the short run, there'd be a little bit less consumer spending, but we're not saving enough. I mean, that's why we're having this conversation about retirement incomes. Mm -hmm. Now, Tony just said something I hadn't known before, which was that the uh, PEI proposal is based on Wolfson's it thing. Is. Okay, so Wolfson's thing is very explicitly not properly funded. He's upfront about that. It's all about more in the present and to be paid for later. So when people say that their proposals for CPB expansion are properly funded, Already there's a problem with that because it's this idea that, yeah, we're going to earn the returns that we're expecting to earn, but they haven't yet been earned, so there's no guarantee. Wolfson doesn't even say that. He says, let's just have some higher benefits in the near term, and then we'll raise the contribution rates on a pay-as-you-go basis. Is that a flaw in the argument? Uh, I think we're, we're going to kind of get lost in these exceptional you know, details here. That His only, plan that is that only, not funded that, that even that in the sense... That only nine people yeah. in the country talk about. I will say that the PEI proposal, they say this is fully funded, which means it would have to be phased in over an exceptionally long period of time. I hear what you're talking about. Yeah, Wolfson is, is saying, let's do it over a shorter period of time, which I wouldn't have a problem with, but you clearly would. I guarantee uh, you 99.9% .9 of the people watching this right now had never heard of Wolfson before you guys yeah, well, so here we go. we're pleased that his name has come into this. <laughs> Ontario as you know has suggested that if it doesn't see the kinds of reforms it would like it'll go it alone. Now I know we already have Ontario Provincial Police as an OPP but they're talking about an Ontario pension plan its own a second OPP if you like. Is that doable? It's doable, but I can't imagine it happening. And Dwight Duncan, former finance minister, has been pretty straightforward in saying, why would you even make a threat that you got no capacity, no intention to carry out? So I, I don't know where that came from. I do think it would be a, a, a bad idea. It's expensive. It's complicated. Uh, how would you integrate it with the existing plans? There'd be one more layer. So it sounds to me like a negotiating tactic, and Ontario is pushing for the bigger CPP. But I'll go back to what I said before. I've not seen anybody demonstrate how one of these things is supposed to run. Wolfson has a proposal out there, and it's up front about the fact that the money's going to just come from the future, if you think about that intergenerational mm -hmm. fairness. Other people are saying fully funded, but we haven't actually seen any proposals. And what concerns me a little bit about this, I said at the beginning, the CPP, modest as it is right now, it's still intergenerationally unfair. When we went through those reforms in the late 90s, 
We didn't undo any of the unfairness. We stopped it getting worse. And on a modest size plan, you'd say, well, it's not really that great a thing, but we can live with that because the amount of money that it's sort of taking from tomorrow's taxpayer, from today's kids, it's tolerable. But if we blow it up bigger, then a tolerable burden becomes intolerable because it's that much bigger. And when Ontario talks about this, I have the same concern. Like, Fast follow up here. Yeah, yeah. What if the contributions were increased immediately, but the payouts were raised just incrementally over a longer period of time? Well, then we would have more saving, which we need in order to back the things but properly. But that gets around the intergenerational problems Absolutely. that you've talked about. Absolutely. So it is does. that an option? It's an option. And I said, like, CPP top up would be like that. The pooled uh, registered pension plan, the, the, the PRPP idea, yeah. that would be the same because they're supposed to be funded. Uh, so anything that involves real saving, uh, that Therefore. can actually back the promises, I'm good with that, and I haven't heard any CPP expansion plan. Tony, what about that? the I've got nine different things to try to answer there, but I'll just say that in terms of intergenerational unfairness, the unfairness in the CPP at the beginning, early on, was that essentially people were promised far more than, than savings were being put in to back those promises. So the changes made in the 90s were to try to catch up and there continues to be some unfairness with some people who retired a while ago or are about to retire getting more than some people are going to retire in the future. It's a hybrid system. But going forward, there's no reason to have intergenerational unfairness. We can, you know, we have actuaries. We can sit down and look at it and say, how much do we need to save to eventually have all of these people retire? Right. It's not that complicated. The system works extremely well. It's just about making it a little bit Bigger. What can about I, an OPP? Can, all right, you want to come back? Can, I, can, yeah, I, can yeah. I get in on this, though? Because yeah. the thing is, so they're counting on making 4% real returns yep. year in, year out for the next 60, 70 years. Now, first of all, if I could get in on that, I'd say that's pretty good, right? Like, given where yields are now. The forecast isn't going to work out perfectly because forecasts never do. The no. problem is that when it doesn't work out the way it's supposed to, and we've seen this already since the reforms, returns were pretty good for a few years. What did they do? They enriched benefits. So people who were drawing out of the plan right away got a little bit more than what they'd been promised after the reforms. When the returns turn out to be a little bit less than expected, is it going to be those same people who are going to uh, pay back? It is not. It's going to be somebody down the road. So the problem isn't that the thing is unpredictable in principle. That's not the main problem. The problem is that when things don't work out as expected, the gains and losses aren't spread evenly across time. Those about to receive will get the gains. The they've, kids will get the losses. They've put in well, you know, a few things here. First of all, they've put in uh, you know pretty substantial controls on this. The, the, the objective they're setting, 4% return, relatively modest. There's no, there are no guarantees. We don't know. We play probabilities, but we don't know exactly what's going to happen. It's relatively modest. On top of that, if there were to have to be modifications to CPP because the benefits under a new plan, an expanded plan, were too generous, you're talking about reforms in like 2047. Like you're talking about really far down the road. And I can't guarantee that politicians are going to screw it up because you know what? They haven't screwed up CPP over the last 20 something years. They've run it extremely, extremely well. What about it's an OPP? Funded. Okay, back to your original question. Yeah. What about an OPP? I don't think it's ideal. It's, it's, it's a second best, it may be even worse than a second best, but, but the, the ideal strategy is look, we have a national program, mm -hmm. expand the national program, don't start going and creating individual provincial pension plans if we can at all possibly avoid that. Quebec does it? Well, but Quebec's is kind of integrated into the Canada Pension Plan. It is a kind of partner plan of the Canada Pension Plan. It was set up that way at the beginning. This would be Ontario going it alone with no other provinces and no federal government. It's, hmm. it's, this, this will be one of the things that I think Bill and I can agree on. This would not be ideal So you're with at the, all. the two DDs. I think Don Drummond <laughs> and Dwight Duncan. Yeah are both against this as yeah, well. Yeah. So is this just and Drummond's a, against it because he's in favor of Canada pension plan expansion. Hmm. Uh, so is this just a political card that the government's keeping in its back pocket to play hopefully never, but it needs it as a threat? Well, I don't know how it oh, works. I don't, yeah, I, I don't know how it works as a threat, though, because the federal government at the moment, under a, a conservative federal government, does not really want to do this. So if you are the province and you say, we're going to do something that you don't want to do unless you do it, the feds may say, great, be our be our guest. <laughs> Go ahead and create your own provincial pension plan. The, let's talk about winners and losers in this. The self-employed, of course, need to pay both the employer and the employee portions of the CPP, so self-employment has pension disadvantages. Is this, in your view, something that needs to be addressed? The thing that's a little unfair about the way people kick into the Canada pension plan is that, first of all, if, there are two points, really. Uh, one is if you're low income, 
you don't even want to be doing what they're already obliging you to do. You're sacrificing in the present in order to have income that is going to get clawed back from you because of the income testing of guaranteed income supplement, OAS, and some provincial stuff as well, depending on where you live. So there are people who are already being forced to save in the CPP who would actually be better off not doing it. And one of the concerns I have about CPP expansion and some other proposals as well, it's not unique to CPP expansion, is you might, cat, you might catch more people in that net who actually wouldn't want to be there. Um, now, the other thing, though, that's weird about the Canada Pension Plan uh, is that if you're, below, if you're above the bottom tax rate, and a lot of self-employed people are, uh, you're only getting credit for your contributions at the bottom tax rate. It's a weird thing. It's, it's a much less advantageous way to save than an ordinary pension plan or an RRSP. So there are flaws in the existing model of the CPP that we live with now because, in my case, I'm just so glad we made the reforms that we did in the late 1990s. I'm saying most countries would give their eye teeth to have done something like that. They'll just Don't leave it alone. mess it up. Yeah, it's very hard to tinker with these things and end up in a better place. Um, but if we made it bigger, I think some of those flaws would become a little bit more obvious and, and we'd be forced to do some tinkering that people aren't to, currently to, talking about. To answer about. Your, your opening question, should you know, uh, self-employed people be paying in, playing both the employer and the employee portion? Right. Yes. yes. In an expanded version, should they be paying? Yes. To come back to, to Bill's point, though, the idea of expanding CPP, that the Prince Edward Island proposal that a lot of the provinces seem to like, including Ontario. Wolfson. Well, which is, comes from Wolfson. The idea there is that it's focused on people earning between 25000 and 100000 So those lower income people yeah. will not, under this proposal, be asked to pay more for exactly the reasons you pointed out, which is they're already receiving significant taxpayer-funded government mm. benefits, which mean that for a lot of them, their income post-retirement may actually be higher than their income when they were working. But did you see this? I mean, Canadian Business Magazine, Larry McDonald, I don't know if you saw that estimate. He says that a jump in CPP premiums could cost the economy 100,000 jobs. You buying? No, not really, uh, because of the fact that it would be phased in over a long period of time. It's a fairly small amount of money, and it would be noise. I think it, I think it would really get lost. If you're talking about increasing you know, the tax on, uh, the payroll tax, on earnings by 1.5 percent and stretching it out over m many years, boy, I, I find does it hard to believe there'd be much of Does that sound like a stretch to you? Well, again, I'm not inclined to resist any kind of pension expansion on the basis of that sort of concern because suppose as individuals we all decided we're not saving enough for retirement, right. we'd better start saving more, then there'd be less consumer spending. But we're in a very saving poor economy right now. I mean, Canada is importing all this saving from abroad because the governments are running big deficits. The household sector's levered itself up to its cheekbones. So I think it would be a good thing, even if in the short run we saw retail sales take a bit of a hit. We need more savings, saving funds, capital investment. I mean, uh, it would be a good thing. Here's Catherine Swift, whom you both know, chair of the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, who has said the number one solution to increasing retirement savings is to leave a few more dollars in the pockets of taxpayers each month. However, we do have... Uh, a lot of unused RSP space right now, right? People just aren't doing the saving. About you pointed it out. three quarters of a trillion, trillion dollars, dollars of unused RSP, RSP contribution yeah. space. So is she right about that? Uh, I would um, worry about CPP expansion on a kind of quasi pay-as-you-go basis, which the current plan still is, partly because then you would be, in, part of it would be saving, but part of it would be a straightforward tax. Uh, but the main concern that I have uh, is uh, uh, really about the uh, propensity of people not to save enough. So I don't know that I'm totally with Catherine on that. I mean, she's certainly suspicious that part of the CPP expansion plan is really to get some of the unfunded liabilities of the public sector pension plans pushed over somewhere mm -hmm. else. So I expressed that concern already. But we should be saving more. And but we're not. I, so I like these proposals that would allow, say I'm an employer of a, of a small business, which in fact the CD House suit is. At the moment we offer a match for our RSP contributions. Happily now everybody's in. Uh, but there were times when people weren't and you'd say there's, there's money on the table here. Why don't you just join the plan? Well, they kind of felt like they needed it now. So people do need a nudge. I like the idea that you're automatically enrolled unless you you know, sign three forms every January to right. get yourself out. I think there are lots of good things we can do. Save 30 for Tony. And that's, that's the British model, by the way, of nudging people in and saying, if you want to opt out, we'll let you, but, but you're in by default, and it's actually, you get more people enrolled. The thing about what Catherine Swift is, is saying 
is that not enough people are currently saving. There's a lot of money being left on the table. And you know what? If you try to save for yourself, you're working with Bay Street. You're looking at mutual funds, active Canadian mutual funds, maybe charging a two, two and a half, three percent a year. Mm -hmm. That's not what you're paying in Canada Pension Plan. All the risks are absorbed across generations, millions of people. You're on your own. If you're in an RSP, you're on your own. And it's just mathematically certain there are going to be a whole variety of results. Some people are going to do very well. Some people are going to do very poorly. That's not what the CPP is. It's an insurance plan. Gentlemen, thank you for the civilized discussion you held here in our discussion <laughs> this afternoon, in our studio rather, this afternoon. We appreciate it very much. My Thanks, pleasure. Steve. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.